a continuation of the Genesis 10 tape of May 29, 1982, for use in the autumn of the year 1982. On the first side of the tape, if you listen carefully, you'll notice that I discuss four areas in which I explain why it is that scholars in the history of Christendom have not put together a science of Noahic origins. There are four explanations. I give three, and then I tack another one on at the end of the tape. Now I'd like to continue with a fifth explanation, one that becomes even more personal with me, and then this will lead into a special area of inquiry in the Genesis 10 project. The fifth reason why the Genesis 10 project has not been pursued successfully arises out of the fourth, where I required that we set aside the empirical philosophy. We still use empiricism, but we set aside the empirical philosophy for a teleological viewpoint. Well, the teleological viewpoint is simply the apocalyptic viewpoint, and it's one that's normal for any Christian with his roots in the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel. However, in the hands of sinners, and we all have sin natures, in, in the hands of sinners, the teleological viewpoint, or the apocalyptic viewpoint, rapidly degenerates into superstition at best and the occult at worst. In other words, the Christian teleologist has strange bedfellows. Uh, the, uh, the logical processes that are at work in Christian apocalyptic thought and Christian uh, symbolic thought, for that matter, and the whole world of poetry, the whole world of the synthetic teleological worldview has much in common with superstition. In fact, it may be very difficult. In fact, at any, point, at any moment, someone could point a finger at me and say, well, that's a superstitious idea. And the word superstition needs looking into critically to see just exactly what that word means. But there's no question that there is such a thing as the occult now take, for example, the whole world of astrology. Now, astrology is very, very important to the Genesis 10 project, not as practiced. Astrology is practiced, I accept without reservation the view that this is, for the most part, an occult manifestation of the Gentile world system. It's no coincidence that Adolf Hitler was into astrology. Uh, astrology has been part of the Hindu tradition all along because these, the the cult of astrology is virtually synonymous with that design system, that cosmos, in its present state, which is unfortunately a satanic state. However, the Gentile cosmos, like all such things, originated in a state of innocence. I mean, it's important to recognize that Satan himself was a creature of God and therefore has a prehistory of innocence. And the same thing is true of astrology. I touch on the world of astrology only once in the big Genesis 10 outline that I've produced, but it's a very significant one in Roman 5 under the outline, which is an insert to the original outline, I had this, the geographic scheme of the zodiac. And this is not an original idea with me, by the way, the, the idea that the zodiac has a geographic range of reference because uh, I've uh, detected some study in that area in Lucan studies in the book of Acts, where there's some thought that the zodiac was used to structure nations or to structure geographic zones of the earth. I Geography, like genetics, was under Noah's teleological control, his utopian control. He had very strong views of geography, reflected, for example, in that tetrad system of rivers in Genesis 2, and reflected further in uh, later Sumero-Akkadian tradition, where the various regions of the earth, that is, the, the part of the earth known to the Mesopotamians, was handled systematically. The old breakdown of Martu in the west, Suver in the north, Akkad in the center, uh, Sumer to the south of center, Elam to the east, and so forth, the Gudium to the northeast. That there's a, there was an understanding of various regions of the earth. Now, perhaps the most important single step I've made recently in the Genesis 10 study is to take the inscription of Lugalanamundu on various regions of the earth and to treat this as, no, as the Noahic heritage, the heritage of Noah's own understanding of the world and his own experience of geography in the, uh, established within the first 30 years after the flood. As his family made their way down from the Caucasus Mountains, I accept the premise that the ark came to rest in the Caucasus Mountains, Mount Ararat, to a fixed point of Eridu 30 years later, Eridu at the mouth of the Euphrates River in Sumer. And uh, just why he has to be at Eridu within 30 years, I'll have to establish elsewhere. Suffice it to say that he, he made his way from Eridu, or from Ararat to, to Eridu within the first 30 years. And in doing this, he traversed eight zones which became part of a Sumero-Akkadian heritage. 
This heritage is reflected mythologically in the opening part of the Enuma Elish, the creation epic of Marduk, as I'll indicate in the two sections devoted to the Enuma Elish in the outline. But also, this uh, system was an eight-fold geographic system tied in with the octad, the Noahic octad, because there were eight survivors of the flood, and it involved eight lands extending, uh, for the most part, southeastward from the Caucasus Mountains in Syria, or Syrian Mesopotamia, to Sumer via various other points to enumerate them in advance. And I'm doing this, again, to tie in with the, with the what I call the geographic scheme of the zodiac to come back to this idea of the occult liability of teleological reasoning. We're talking about teleo teleology, and now we're talking about geographic teleology, or various zones of the earth. The, what I'm after here is fairly obvious. The antediluvian world consisted of four zones spelled out as such in Genesis 2, early Genesis, the four zones of the earth. The post-diluvian world, I'm saying, the immediate post-diluvian world established by Noah's family within the first 30 years after the flood was an eight-fold breakdown based on the Noahic octad, a Noahic octad of eight survives of the flood, four men, four women, recorded, as I believe, in this marvelous pictorial mythological imagery of the Gundestrup cauldron, that, that amazing artifact discovered in Denmark in the year 1892. Suffice it to say, then, that you have eight regions established after the flood, four regions established before the flood, and the summation of the two is 12, and 12, of course, is the number of the zodiac, the number of the 12 tribes of Israel, the number of the Christian apostles, a great theocratic number. If you double it, then, of course, you have the number 24, which would tie in with the 24 elders of the apocalypse. But at uh, any rate, these eight zones, these eight post-Diluvian zones established within the first 30 years, what were they? Well, I'll give them first of all, and then go back to the inscription of, of Lugalanamundu. Well, perhaps I can give the material from, uh, from Lugalanamundu. This is out of page 51 of Kramer's The Sumerians. Lugalanamundu was a, a king or a Sumerian ruler of Adab, a rather unimportant Sumerian city, who claimed an imperial reign over the whole Sumero-Akkadian world before their the rise of the Akkadians. So you wouldn't even call it the Sumero-Akkadian world because the Akkadians had, had were yet to come. He's, he's a pre-Akkadian Sumerian ruler who claims uh, to control the universe, that is the Mesopotamian version of the universe. Lugalanamundu, according to this document, is king of the four quarters of the universe, a ruler who made all the foreign lands pay steady tribute to him. Then as we get into his tributaries, the people who paid to him, we get an octet, a group of eight. When the temple, that is the Anamzu temple at Adab was completed, our document continues, Lugalanamundu dedicated it to the goddess with sacrifice, that is Nintu, who apparently is a variation of Ninhur Saga, whom I identify with the yellow matriarch, yellow antediluvian matriarch. Lugalanamundu dedicated it to the goddess with sacrifices of seven times seven fatted oxen, fatted sheep, and the viziers or sukolmas of, and then here's the enumeration, Cedar Mountain, Elam, Markhashi, Gutium, Suber, Martu, Sutium, and Ayana, the old name for the kingdom of Erech, which is more or less synonymous with Sumer, came with sacrifices to the Adab temple in order to participate in the celebration. Now, I've always been inhibited in using this octad as Noahic tradition only because a couple of the lands enumerated in it are not clearly placed by Kramer. They are unknown. They were unknown at the time this book was published, and as far as I know, they continue to be unknown, although work has been done. Kramer believed that Cedar Mountain, because the arrangement of the list was in the east. You have uh, Elam, which is clearly in the east, and Gudium, which is in the east, and interspersed with those two, you have Cedar Mountain and Marhashi. Now, L.A. Waddell believed that Marhashi was Persia, and I followed him in that belief, that it was an eastern land of central Iran, more or less uh, synonymous, I suppose, with the Persia of Persepolis, uh, at any rate, east of Elam, apparently. However, Cedar Mountain... Kramer believes was even further east, the Rock, Makran coast, Baluchistan, or even the Indus, perhaps. The older view was that because of the Cedars of Lebanon, the, that the Cedar Mountain region was the Amanus region in the west. And the fact is that hypothetically I require such a region if this is a Noahic heritage, because I'm quite confident that Noah spent the first eight years, and we'd have to show later why eight, Noah spent the first eight years after the flood in the land of Syria and Mesopotamia, or Syria, and in the, uh, that is between the Caucasus and the Amanus range, and south of it in the land of Syria. So Cedar Mountain works for me if, in fact, it is not eastern or southeastern, but northwestern. That is, if it is the Amanus re region, that works for me, and I've been inhibited 
from taking that hypothetical step because of Kramer's influence, because he thinks that Cedar Mountain was in the east. If it was in the northwest, things fall into place. And basically, Noah's family made their way over those eight regions in the following sequence. They start off in Suber, which is the northern land, which extends all the way to the, to the uh, Caucasus Mountains. And this was Noah's own personal claim, land claim. Noah and the red map work, as it turns out, and the nation that is established there in Noah's name is the great Ural Altaic stock, the people of the heaven god, Anu. Uh, the Korean word for god is a generic uh, word for god is based on the, on the name of the heaven god. The El El Yon of Psalm 82 is the god of Noah in particular in the same way that Jehovah Elohim was the god of Shem in uh, Genesis 9. And the claim of Noah in the land of Suber, which includes Ararat itself, which it would extend hypothetically throughout the whole Caucasus uh, to the north of Mesopotamia, becomes his claim for the Ural Altaic people. So I would agree with an author who has conjectured that the Suberians were Ural Altaics. I think they were part of the Ural Altaic stock, and another part was at Arata, further, much further to the east, in central Iran, possibly Isfahan. The second claim was the claim of Japheth, and as it turns out, the black matriarch. And the nation established there at the Amanus claim, the Cedar Mountain claim, was the root stock of the so-called Hamitic people, namely the Egyptians, who came under the power of Ham at a later time. So these names are very equivocal. These ethnic names are very equivocal. The, I'm saying that the so-called Hamitic or Egyptian stock was established originally by Japheth, who survives in Egyptian mythology as the earth god Keb, by Japheth, but then passes into the hands of Ham later. So the Amanus claim the second. So they start off at Suba, then they go to Syria, and in crossing the upper Euphrates River at Carchemish, they go out of the Ural Altaic sphere into the Hamitic sphere as far as these very ancient traditions. Now, the, the political history of Noah's family erased much of this later, but uh, the Turks, as a matter of fact, took over Turkey which includes Ararat, and what I'm saying is the Turks are, of course, Ural Altaic, and therefore they're returning to what originally was their linguistic claim. So the Turks, in, in a sense, have a right to the, that part of the Caucasus Mountains uh, because of what uh, we've just indicated. Well, the second claim, then, was the claim of the Amanus region for the Hamites under Japheth. Then the third claim was beyond Jebel Bishri to the south, that is Martu, the classic land of the Semites. And there, the land claim was that of the Semitic linguistic stock, which... Published at Naughton Gath was the stock of Canaan, that is Ham. Ham was the one responsible for founding the so-called Semitic linguistic stock. Now that stock came later under the power of Shem, justifying the name. But it was originated by Ham and his royal wife in this ultra-primitive uh, period uh, of the white matriarch and established in Martu the third claim, the claim of the Semitic linguistic stock. Then, uh, in Akkad, then they crossed the Euphrates River into the center of the heart of Mesopotamia, the land of Akkad, called Sutium by Lugalanamundu. And this then became the land claim of Shem and eventually of the Indo-European stock. However, as we indicate, Shem, the, the, the formation of the Indo-European stock was delayed because of a prohibition on mother-son incest uh, in terms of the white matriarch and Shem because Shem was a son, as would Japheth. Japheth and Shem were sons of the white matriarch. They could not uh, mate with her uh, because of that prohibition. Consequently, the formation of the nuclear Indo-European stock was delayed. People throw up their hands in horror and say, I thought Shem was the father of the Semites. Well, in a sense, politically he was, but genetically it's another matter. Uh, Shem, uh, the Jehovah Elohim of Shem, is associated with the universal storm god. This associates in turn with Ali and Val of Ugarit in the Semitic sphere, but also Thor in the Teutonic sphere, and that's the key. Uh, uh, Shem actually authored the Indo-European stock and gave it its land claim on Akkad, a land claim reflected specifically in the Kanunas panel, the Gundas Troop Cauldron, which is of Celtic origin and therefore of Indo-European origin. The fifth land claim was in the Zagros Mountains by the Red Matriarch and was that of the Amarin stock. The sixth claim was at Marhashi that I put hypothetically in uh, Persia, and that is the claim of the Yellow Matriarch uh, in behalf of the Sino-Tibetan stock the seventh next to last claim was that of the black matriarch for the land of Elam. And Elam, that land to the east of the Tigris, lower Tigris, opposite Sumer, was originally the black land, but then was evacuated of blacks later. But it was the homeland of the blacks in this proto-historic period. And then the second white stock, the brachycephalic whites, the Sumerians, were the eighth stock 
formed in the name of the white matriarch who survived the flood in the land of Sumer. So there's a succession of eight lands. Now those eight lands, in Noah's thinking, were a continuation of the progress made by his family out of the four lands which he had circuited by way of preparing for the flood. And so the four lands were added to the eight lands, and the result then was a scheme which was so important to Noah that he associated it with the stars, or someone associated it with the stars. The Anima Elish claims that Marduk was the one responsible for forming the zodiacal scheme, actually with three, a total of 36 constellations altogether. And of course, there are only the 12 zodiacal constellations. The zodiacal constellations are along the plane of the ecliptic, which is the plane of the solar system where the sun, moon, and stars move. And it's a string of constellations. In some cases, the constellation is just a region. Uh, cancer is so faint, it's barely even a constellation at all. Whereas some of the other zodiacal constellations, such as Scorpius, are very brilliant, have bright stars in them, very prominent. Well, the 12 signs of the zodiac then become a uh, virtually an incarnation of the Gentile uh, cosmos in terms of a primitive geography, a geography that's largely been forgotten. But I list here in Roman five of my outline, the 12 signs of the zodiac. Then I'll go on to discuss again the, the occult liability where we draw the line between the innocent side of something such as astrology, uh, that is the, simply the knowledge that there were 12 signs and they refer to the 12 geographic zones, and then of course the preternatural side. We want to continue to draw that barrier and draw that line, and at the same time I want to discuss my own personal relationship to astronomy, my own feeling for the star stars for astronomical observation and so forth, which was part of my own background. Okay, the uh, Roman 5 geographic scheme of the zodiac, a 12-fold summation of four antediluvian lands and eight post-diluvian lands of four above. That's the principle. I need to write that in. It isn't written in here. The principle behind the geographic scheme of the zodiac is uh, a 12-fold summation of four antediluvian lands and eight post-diluvian lands listed in section 4, and that is the eight post-diluvian lands that I've just enumerated from Lugalana Mundu's system. B, the 12 zodiacal constellations. Number one, Pisces, two fishes. This is one of those faint constellations. It doesn't look like much if you look at it. It's uh, rather large, but its stars are very faint. There are no real prominent stars in it at all. Pisces, two fishes. Uh, identified mythologically with Adapa's home of the fishes in the myth of Adapa, that key figure Adapa, who is Seba, a son of Japheth and the black matriarch, uh, their union, and one of the important gods of the of the um, of the world outside Mesopotamia, namely Osiris of the Egyptian tradition and Shiva or Shiv of the East Indian tradition. A, the land, the land referred to by Pisces, antediluvian Kush, the southern land of the antediluvian blacks, duplicated in post-diluvian Kush, which is, of course, Ethiopia. Location, the Gulf of Aden. C, ethnic, nominal race of Adam, the black quarter of the human race. And that would mean the children of Adam younger than said. D, dual representatives. In the post diluvian scheme, a dual representative of each of these different groups. The black matriarch and Japheth, the parents of Seba Adapa. And I might add here that the black matriarch and Japheth, uh, Japheth was not black. He was quite white and a major contributor to the Indo-European tradition. But uh, he entered into, a, for the purpose of forming this first cosmos, he entered into this royal union with the black matriarch. And the two of them together appear in the Anima Elish under the name Lachmu, Japheth, and Lahamu. Number two, Ares, the ram, associate with the lamb sacrifice of Abel and with the ram of Hermes, the uh, ram held by Hermes. Hermes is one of the Hellenic versions of the patriarch Ham. Ham's distinctive was that he was an amaranth. He came from the land of Havila, Andalusian land of Havila, and that was the race of Abel. Uh, it, it appears in the text, again, that Genesis is so elliptical that it would appear that Abel never had a progeny, but I believe that he did, and that that was the amaranth prog progeny from which Ham came and from which he was distinguished from his two white brothers, uh, J uh, uh, Japheth and Shem, <coughs> and then from his father, who was of Sethite origin, therefore yellow, mongoloid. So the Sethite stock is the mongoloid, and all three sons then, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, are all mongoloid in the male line, but distinguished by the white matriarch in two cases, by the red matriarch in one case. 
Ares the ram, lamb sacrifice of Abel, the ram of Hermes. The land is antediluvian Havilah, which is the western land. The location is approximately that of the Nile River. Ethnic, the ethnic race of that land was the race of Abel, the red, the universal Amarin stock that destined to inhabit the Americas. The dual uh, representatives, Ham, Hermes, and the white matriarch, parents of Canaan and Hellenic foot. Uh, the union of the red and white matriarchs forming the so-called Mediterranean race and that being in turn the foundational racial type of the Semites. And I've just indicated that the Semites of Martu owe their origin to Shem and Canaan, who was, I should, should say Ham and Canaan, who was a son of Ham by the white matriarch. The third sign of the zodiac in order, and we're reading these in order, is Taurus the bull, the mongoloid Gutanu. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Gutanu, or the bull of heaven, represents a part of the Mongoloid stock alienated from the Caucasoids of the Mesopotamia in the great Iranian Mesopotamian War in the days of Enmerkar of Erech, the great war between the Iranian forces, primarily Mongoloids and blacks, against a white alliance of Mesopotamia. But back in the Antediluvian scheme, Taurus the bull, Mongoloid Gutanu, the land in this case is ant the Antediluvian land of Seth, the northern location, the river Volga, ethnic, the race of Seth, that is the yellow or Mongoloid race, and dual representatives Noah, the Sethite, and the red matriarch. The fourth element of it, Gemini the twins, the antediluvian full brothers Shem and Japheth, sons of the white matriarch, and uh, called uh, twins for that reason only, that they were full brothers. However, there's also a remote possibility uh, that will have to be studied further that Shem and Japheth were in fact twins, even though Japheth is called Hagadol, the great one, as though he were the elder. The land is the Antediluvian land of Nod, the eastern land of the Antediluvian cosmos, the location of the river Indus, ethnic, the race of Cain, the white race, and we indicate in the handout narrative why we believe that the Caucasoid race is the race of Cain, and dual representative Shem and the yellow matriarch, that is, the, in the scheme of the survivors of the flood, Shem's royal wife was the yellow matriarch, and together the two of them uh, represented this, uh, this sphere of, of Gemini. Then Cancer. Now Cancer becomes the first of the post-Diluvian regions, where you go over from the fourfold antediluvian scheme to the eightfold post-Diluvian scheme, geared to the eight survivors of the flood, and then various post-Diluvian offspring of theirs. Cancer the crab. Uh, cancer is so faint, the only thing you associate with it is retrograde motion of the sun, and it symbolizes the retrograde migration pattern of the first eight years after the flood. This is a migration pattern indicated by the Lug Tyrannus panel, and just briefly to indicate it, uh, what we believe, what I believe about this, is that there, are, there were eight camps formed by Noah's family within the first eight years after the flood, one for each year. And the, the locations within Syrian Mesopotamia were as follows. The first camp at Tel Halath, the second at Haran, which was the birthplace of our Foxid one, the son of Shem, two years after the flood, the camp at Carchemish on the upper Euphrates River, the dividing line between the first two land claims, a camp at Gaziantep, a south of that, a camp at Arman, and then doubling back in the retrograde manner of the crab again, uh, the city of Emar, the, not in the city, but the camp of Emar, uh, south of the one at Carchemish, south of the one at on the uh, Balak River, Haran, uh, down the line of the, the river Balak, which is named for Balak, the first Kish name of Shem, is Raqqa, and then the last camp, the eighth camp, was at Jebel Bishri, the entranceway into Mesopotamia and Martu to the south, the Syrian desert. That retrograde motion then was symbolic of the first uh, development of the post-Diluvian world. The land was post-Diluvian Suber, the first northern position of the scheme. The location was the upper river Tigris, or Assyria. The ethnic association was the Ural Altaic, the race formed around Noah, in particular around his god, the heaven god, El Elyon in the Hebrew tradition, Anu and An in the sumero Kidian tradition. Dual representatives, Ashkenaz, the founder of the Ural Altaics, and Foot son of Ham, the founder, among other things, of the finno ugrians as well as the, the Hellenes and different branches of his family. The sixth uh, sign, the sixth constellation, a fairly bright one, is Leo the lion. This is the Egyptian lion. Throughout the Gunderstrup panel and in Egyptian tradition itself, the entire Egyptian stock is pictured as a lion. The land then is post-Diluvian Cedar Mountain, the western position beyond Carchemish, over the uh, upper Euphrates, the first western position. The location is that of the upper river Tigris, Amanus, that is Syria. 
ethnic, uh, the Egyptians. Of course, the Egyptians did not inherit Syria. They inherited the Nile. But that's because of political history. The, the point is they made a Western claim that includes the Levantine coast and extends all the way to the mouth of the Nile from this claim, this Western claim. And the dual representatives of the post-Diluvian world and representing the Egyptians was the uh, Gomer and Mitzrayim. Gomer, the yellow son of Japheth, and Mitzrayim, the yellow son of Ham, and as I've indicated, the Egyptian stock was founded by Japheth and taken over by Ham. The next constellation is that of Virgo the Virgin, which has one bright star in its speaker. The Egyptians identified this constellation with their goddess Isis, who happened to be the red daughter of Japheth, who reappears in the Semitic world. The West Semitic tradition is Adum, wife of Canaan Resheth, and mother of the Semitic linguistic stock. The land in this case is post-Diluvian Martu, the second western position, the one beyond Jebel Bishri as uh, Noah's family made its way south and eastward into Mesopotamia or toward Mesopotamia. The location is the Syrian desert. The ethnic group associated with this was the Semitic. The dual representatives were Canaan, the white Semites, and Seba Adamu, the black son of Japheth and the black matriarch, who accounts for the black Semites of Ethiopia, the Amhara. The eighth position was that of the constellation of Libra, which consists of just two stars, basically, of moderate magnitude. The balance scales. Here the land is post-Diluvian Akkad, the second northern position, coupling, as it were, with Subir. The location is central Mesopotamia. The ethnic group targeted for this originally is the Indo-European. The dual representatives are Mosh, son of Shem, by their white sister, the post-Diluvian white matriarch, son of Noah, and the white, and the white Antediluvian a son, daughter of Noah, and the white Antediluvian. And uh, then Madai, son of Japheth, the analogous white uh, son of Japheth, known to the Sumerians as Mashta, first Kish. The ninth, uh, the ninth sign, or the ninth constellation, is Scorpion, uh, Scorpius, the Scorpion. And here we have an association with the Zagros Mountains and Gudium through uh, Udu Hegel's uh, characterization of the Gudians as the Scorpion of the Mountain. We have the land of Gudium, the first eastern position, the location of the Zagros Mountains, the ethnic, the Amorins. And again, the Amorins were not destined to inhabit the Zagros for very long. The claim was purely an abstract one through the Red Matriarch. And the dual representatives of the Red Matriarch were Utz, son of Shem by the Red Matriarch. That is the Aramean Utz of the land of Job, of the tradition of Job, and Magog, son of Japheth, who was Japheth's red son by the Red Matriarch. The tenth position, the tenth Constellation is Sagittarius the Bowman, which symbolizes the archer Marduk, Shelah, conqueror of Arata, in his overthrow of Tiamat in the Enema Elish. The land involved here is Makashi, the second eastern position. The location is central Iran, possibly including Isfahan Arata, and the ethnic group is the Sino-Tibetans. The dual representatives in this case are Arfaxit I, Shem's son by the Yellow Matriarch, father of the Sino-Tibetans, the Chinese in particular, and Sabteka, the father of the Uto Athabascans, the Amarin stock. And Sabteka was abstracted from the Sino Tibetan stock into the Amarin in the mythological slaughter of Gutanu. I'm obviously running out of tape here, don't have sufficient time to do as much as I wanted to with these short half hour tapes. The 11th sign of the 11th constellation is Capricornus, the sea goat, and traditionally this represents Pan, son of Hermes. Hermes, once again, is one of the Hellenic versions of Ham, and his only son in that context is his firstborn son, the black Hamite Cush son of Ham, firstborn of the post-Diluvians. The land in this case is Luma, the first southern, which is the black land and Toto. The location is Elam, the lower Tigris, the east bank of the lower Tigris. The ethnic group is the blacks in general, and that involves more than the African blacks of Cush. The dual representatives are Cush, the ancestor of the African blacks, and Rifith, the black son of Noah, the ancestor of the Indian blacks, or Dravidians. The twelfth and last sign is Aquarius the water pourer, and here we have the motif of Sumerian Lagashite Gudia, Prince Sidon, son of Canaan, an ultra white patriarch because Canaan was Ham's white son and Sidon was a white son of the white son. The land is Ayana, the second southern position, Sumer in other words. The location is Sumer, the lower Euphrates, the ethnic group is the Sumerians, and the dual representatives are Togarma, who the Armenians for some reason claim is their own. Actually, he was the he was the brachycephalic white son of brachycephalic Noah and was the ancestor of the genetically, physically, of the Sumerian stock, and then the black son of Shem, Hul, the father of the Amarin uh, Olmecs, and Hul, like Sabteka, was abstracted into the Amarin stock. It's because of this abstraction of two patriarchs, Sabteka, red son of Noah, 
and hull black son of Shem into the Amarin stock that the Amarins have a tetrad cosmos instead of a dual cosmos. Instead of a dual tradition, they have a tetrad or fourfold tradition. We're very near a couple of errata items that I noticed on this side of the tape where I was really rushing to finish. Uh, one is that I refer to the upper Euphrates at one point as the upper Tigris. You'll notice that mistake. The upper Euphrates was the basis of uh, the second Amanus claim of the Egyptian stock primarily. The other mistake somewhere, and I didn't notice it the last time I referred to the uh, planets as stars, as though I didn't know the difference. The ecliptic is the plane in which the sun, moon, and the planets are observed to move, and that's a, an important consideration in the lore of astrology and also in the symbolism of this geography that we're talking about where the fixed stars along the ecliptic, the zodiac, represents 12 zones of the earth, four of them definable in the antediluvian world, the antediluvian age, and eight of them definable in the post-diluvian.